so uh, we look after the health of workers and um, in the Department of Health, and uh, and I run a big compensation fund for about four billion rand for ex mine workers in terms of the problems that they face in building the economy that got us to where we were, including this building. So if you read the plaque, it's a very interesting plaque in terms of uh, where this building comes from, Moyeni. Uh, in terms of what's called the Rand Lords, people that ran uh, the mining industry for a long, long time in this country. And this ridge is basically part of the Rand Lord Bridge, stretching all the way across uh, into observatory and on the other side. Uh, and on the other side, it's Westcliff. Uh, so they overlooked on one side, uh, you know, the northern suburbs and on the other side, the southern suburbs. But the Rand Lords basically ran things. So just by way of background, um, we're getting to the meat of the matter, which is called lungs. So, uh, so for the first time, you're getting to know uh, what goes on. And it's amazing that we still have our lungs and uh, <coughs> nut pathology because between air pollution problems, the valve triangle, uh, it's called the Sasselbeck Triangle. So air pollution is a major problem that's affecting us, and there's some work being done right now about power stations and utilities. We won't mention the name. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> one, one multinational, uh, well, it's South African, but it all has interlocking relationships across the region. Uh, so there's the issue around coal power and lung pollution. And then there's problems around the fact of work-related problems that cause problems with the lungs. We have interpersonal violence where we stab each other and kind of uh, injure each other. And one of the issues is we stab at the lungs. Because we, the lungs and the heart are close by. So when people try to kill each other or whatever it is, they kind of stab at the heart. Yeah, it is. So there's a range of stuff that affects the lungs. So today we're going to hear a bit more about it. And, uh, and, and input in terms of it, and later on I'll, I'll talk a bit. So what I'm going to do is take the first panel of three speakers. It's quite a distinguished panel. Uh, they'll talk a bit about themselves and, and input, and then um, we'll have the next three, which is more the drama type side of inputs and the art side. And really thanks to Beth and the team for interdisciplinary stuff. It's, uh, it's a fascinating world when we can actually learn from each other and share experiences. Uh, medicine as a biomedical science often is very narrow in its outlook. But when you start looking at medicine in what we call the social determinants of health, our housing, water, sanitation, air pollution affects health, then you begin to say that those of us that are operating in the very narrow realm of bi biomedical sciences have very little to contribute. I'm not saying that heart transplants are not important, but we could have prevented heart transplants to a session coming on in the afternoon called diet. Right, our food eating habits and, and, and stress in, in societies, etc. So really, thanks to the team for pulling this together. Let me hand over to Stacy. Stacy, tell us a bit about yourself. She's got a small video, and then uh, we'll get going. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Stacy Heidi. I would like to start off by just thanking the organizers for this amazing, amazing opportunity, and to say that I'm deeply humbled to be here especially after having seen the presentations of the last few days, which have really been provocative and amazing. Thank you to everyone who's in the room. Um, I'm a writer. I also work as an editor at Chimarengo, which is a pan-African journal. And I'm going to be speaking about a play that I wrote and performed. I'm billed on the, which is called the Museum of Lungs. I'm billed on the program as the creator of, and I just want to put a bit of a disclaimer on that, um, in that it was very much a collaborative work. I worked with musician uh, Naomi Younger, uh, who some of you might know, as well as two Egyptians, a director called Leila Solomon and Nancy Monir. And really one of the things we tried to do and why I want to raise this interdisciplinary work is that we did try to also very much look at can we take seriously ideas of music as knowledge? And there's a primacy, a primacy of the word always. But we, we try to tell the story both through words but other parts of the story also through music and through images, and those were all really important things for us. Um, the, however, I suppose I am to some extent the creator in that the work is based on my story and a personal story, and it was a story of living undiagnosed um, for many years with uh, tuberculosis. And that I went undiagnosed, in my opinion, was largely a question of how disease is racialized in South Africa. And I think it was easier. The last doctor I went to see, I left in tears after I was basically told that the disease wasn't in my body, it was in my head, and that I was a crazy, uh, hysterical, anorexic white woman, 
and I'm all those things, but I said, that's not why I've come to see you. Yes, I know that, but that's not the problem. But I then kind of, I suppose, was left with the, there's something wrong, but I don't know what it is. And that experience for me was a profound experience. I, I developed a relationship with something that was in my body and that I could sense was in my body, but I had no name for it. And we talked a lot about naming. And I came up with things. I used to call it, my friends will, will always, I would be saying, my creature, the thing, is, are the kind of terms I was using because there's a very sense of there is something else living here inside me. And when I was finally diagnosed, that relationship was so profound that when I was told, here's the cure, take it, I kind of find myself asking, do I want to be cured? And do I want to kill this thing that I've lived with now for many, many years and developed a relationship with? And afterwards, I was placed in isolation. And during that period of time, I wrote. Um, and it was an attempt to make sense of what had happened to me, um, the philosophical questions. Um, and also, once I had a name, you have TB, to try to make sense of what that meant in this context. And I find myself digging into my own history and the colonial history, and trying to also ask about my own, one of the very difficult questions and the difficult things to deal with was speaking about my own culpability within, um, within this disease. And as a white person in this country, how do I find language to talk about that culpability? I, the, the uh, 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 director um, read some of the work and finally, um, I was asked to make a play out of it, and I stupidly said yes, and spent the last year working on the play. We did premiere in Joburg and play in Cape Town, and then we toured um, in the rest of the continent and also in Europe extensively for the second half of last year, and we've got another three short tours, unfortunately, all in Europe um, this year as well. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to play just the trailer. I'm just going to play the trailer um, for for the for the play, and then I'm going to do some reading. And for those of you who did see the play, a bit of an apology. I've cut up bits from the text with some of the more theoretical questions that didn't end up in the script because we were really trying to do storytelling in terms of the script. Um, and I'm going to play a video in the background, which is you're hearing me talk, and I thought for those of you who are not wanting to hear my voice or hear me talk, I'll give you some other voices to read. So they're really writers um, that I really like and admire talking about ways of writing the body, which has been a theme in an earlier session. So there are two layers. You can choose where you want to focus, and if you get tired of me, just look backwards, and, and you can read other people. My country is full of holes and so is my body. Minds and mass graves, torture and exile, disappearances, massacres, rapes. My body is a site of multiple digs. Some nights, I hear sounds, a rasping that hovers like an echo in my body, a sound I can only understand as communion between my body, the dying earth and the dead bodies it holds. The city I live in is built on holes. My forefathers were miners, European migrants who journeyed to the colony to mine the soil. We brought the disease with us, smuggled on ships, loosed in blood across decks. The colony becomes a dumping ground for Western waste and industrious, the sick, the poor, the criminal. TB hospitals are built on the frontier of colony, Far away from civilization, towns spring up around them. Thousands of destitute Eastern European consumptives arrive, fleeing the TB epidemic in their homelands. They cannot afford the treatment. They wander the hills and valleys of the Eastern Cape, spread their bacteria into air, rivers. Trees cough and dust scatters. Blood seeps up and drowns a valley. In death, my forefathers share their, the graves with the black miners who came after. Tunnels are dug out, mine shafts, pit latrines, sinkholes that disappear people. Men are dropped into darkness. Their blasts of echoes, dust rises, infects the air. Silica dust can never be removed. Always it remains, a film, a scrim, coating everything embedded in the system. 
how then do you breathe correctly? How often should I take a deep breath? And what if the air that surrounds me is polluted, contaminated by uranium and asbestos from the mining industry, poisoned by history, by hate and violence? What if breathing makes you dizzy? And what if it makes you sick? What if the air carries bacteria? History is never erased, only hidden, dusted into corners, swept under the carpet. My people, mine. From the Oxford English Dictionary, mine, A, a pronoun, my, belonging to me, B, noun, a pit or tunnel dug in the earth, which, pr which precious stones or ores or coal are taken by digging or other methods. So where then does my story begin? Is it at my birth or at the bottom of a mine shaft? Is it with the holes in my body? There are so many, those that I'm born with and those that come after. The body recalls, it harbors ruins, sorrows, keeps what the mind cannot contain. My body is a gravesite, a hole. It grows deeper. From an early age, I'm taught holes are dangerous. They open us up to contamination, um, infection. I'm to keep myself erect, sealed off at a safe distance, live, but don't breathe. The feeling that makes me want to jump out of my own skin. Can this be my body if I don't like it? Initially, I feel like I'm losing bits of me. I look in the mirror and no longer recognize myself, or maybe it's just that I see myself more clearly. I've become see-through. On the x-ray, the disease shows up as an emptiness, a hole, a gap where one oughtn't to exist, a cavity, the nothing space between breasts, between breaths. The doctor says, you have to be, the disease is bacterial, it's taken root in your body and it's possible it's lived inside there for many years, lying dormant, latent in medical vocabulary, immune repressed. It waits until you're at your weakest, possibly from bad eating habits or overworking or not sleeping. Immediately, I'm guilty. I've brought the disease on myself. Always that culpability. I have guilt in my mouth, dirt in my lungs. Maybe my sickness is a punishment, a form of retribution, payback for the crimes I've inherited. Or maybe it's just a symptom of my desire to create difference, to place a distance between me and the world I was born into. Fanon describes colonialism as something suffocating, a system that sucks oxygen, makes breathing impossible. Fees must fall, echo him. I can't breathe. My lungs are colonized. They understand only lack, to sigh in longing, to gasp in relief. A white, writes Anton Otoe, is one whom the spirits have abandoned. Long before him, Native Americans identified the Western compulsion to consume the earth as itself a sickness. The wetico disease, they called it. I try to ask my doctor more questions, but I can see the look on his face. He tells me to not think about sickness, but rather about healing, about my new journey towards wellness. How then do I make sense of my diagnosis? More than anything, I want to journey down the holes my, the disease has eaten in my body to understand how this wee eating works medically. Does the disease eat me because it's hungry? Do diseases know what they're eating? Does my disease prefer kidneys to lungs? Are my insides yummy? Is the hole literal? Is a gap or a gape in my organ? Or does the doctor mean metaphorically? Is it like a black hole or more like a mine shaft? I want to cut a hole in my skin and crawl inside to excavate. I Google TB but understand nothing. The website's aimed at the general public, focus on symptoms and cures. And the journals are impenetrable, written in dense medical jargon. Their entire focus is categorization. There's no space for life, neither the lived experience of the infected, nor the life of the disease itself. I find my answers elsewhere. In mythology, TB is a disease of secretion, disintegration, a disease of liquids, the body turning into phlegm and mucus and sputum, blood finally. It's disease of fevers, of creative fervor, insatiable desire of broken hearts and unrequited love, a disease of wanting and wasting, a disease that literally eats holes in the flesh and organs, a vampiric disease, a disease of emancipation then, of holes, lying down then starvation, the inner hollowing, blinking, breathing slower, dying. There are graves, bones buried beneath my feet, a hole, it grows deeper. 
My sickness makes me vulnerable, more out of control, less certain, more precarious. Its volatility and seeming intangibility, its dizziness frightens me. Half the nights I don't know my body when I wake to it. It's hot and alive, burning and restless, filled with visions. In the morning it wears bruises I don't remember making. Did it take off without me, walking the streets, hunting for love, for a victim? Virginia Woolf says the illness can masquerade as love, love sickness, a frightening romance. In love, the body is taken hold of by forces, seized and ripped through by something foreign. Where does one body end and another one begin? Is the disease something that lives inside me, or is it a part of me? Kafka frequently fretted that he was not human being and that what he bore on his body was not a human head. If not human, what then? Camille Roy says, I don't know if you're creating a monster. Clarice Lispector asks, am I a monster or is this what it means to be human? In the hospital, my sheets are changed every few days. The process is mechanical, stripped and bundled. I smell myself leaving the nurse's arms and I imagine my tangled limbs damp and fettered rolling around in the industrial washer, intertwining with the stains of other patients. I remember a woman who pissed in her bed every night in the hospital when I first arrived. She refused to use the bedpan provided and insisted on being carried to the toilet. When no one complied, she lay sodden in her own urine. In hospital, bodily fluids are the only form of resistance left. I admit I'm no different. I'm armed with nothing but my leaking gut, my bleeding wounds, my broken heart and limbs, my sickness. Racism needs the fiction that bodies are pure, pure cultures, pure blood. The etymological root of the words privilege and private are the same. In Latin, privus, which simply means individual. That an individual can have privacy is also the extent that individual can be private. My private isolation ward. My loneliness. Our whiteness self is a kind of totalizing assumption towards privacy. Online I see pictures, high walls, barbed wire. With the outbreak of drug-resistant tuberculosis, some hospitals have come to resemble prisons. During my stay, 49 highly infectious, drug-resistant tuberculosis patients break out of a hospital isolation unit to spend Christmas with their families. And I find myself in solidarity with them, backing the escaped men from my tiny isolation ward. I cheer them on. The police have launched a manhunt. The patients have become criminal, made villainous through illness. The authorities promise that the patients will be, and I quote, hunted, captured, and brought back. And I think how similar the words of health officials are to those used by politicians, the whole language of disease, how bacteria are said to infiltrate foreign agents in the blood, in the lymph, traveling with impunity, wreaking destruction. The war on diseases is launched by the medical establishment. For the health system to get along with illness, patients must be considered outlaws. Reads a statement by the Socialist Patients Collective, which was a radical German Marxist organization formed in February 1970 that proposed that act to actively promote illness as a protest against capitalism and opposing medical doctors as the alleged ruling class of capitalism, turning illness into a weapon they proclaimed. The kidney stone that makes you suffer, they declared, is the same as the, kid as the stone thrown in the control room of capitalism. Today the clinical term is tuberculosis, but I prefer the old name, consumption. Can my sickness be an opposition to capitalist consumerism? I'm on shaky ground. These issues are fraught and complex and there's a danger of romanticizing illness. In addition, it's opportunistic to claim to be struggling against the conditions one is actually reproducing. How does one protest you when you've been cared for and cured by the system you're attacking? Nobody is innocent. We're all culpable, implicated and damaged, conscripted and consigned. Often we're not even conscious of the snares we're caught in and yet our bodies have the capacity to subvert and expose ideology and politics. Bacteria is never singular, always plural. Is my disease connected to your disease? Bacteria is sex, is polymorphous and polyligamous. Bacteria exchange DNA with other bacteria and even with their hosts. 
Is the disease a time machine? Do they speak to each other? Can I speak through it? Can it offer way other ways of being different to what we've inherited? Other ways of being human that are more human than the inhumanity of the contemporary? How do lungs speak? When and where do they speak from? And how do I find new ways to breathe, to sing? I'm going to leave it there because I've been given my call. Thanks, Burton. I mean, thanks, uh, Stacey. It was very inspiring in terms of the personal, and I hate to use the word survivor because you've, you've just ex a, a, a raised with me the issues around war terminology, which often we use as, as medical colleagues. But, but it's great to have the human face to a biological problem and, and, and the wider aspects. Thanks. I'm going to hand over to Bavesh, uh, as a close colleague of mine from the NHLS. Uh, where I previously used to be at the National Institute. And Bhavesh is one of our preeminent scientists and uh, will now probably talk about the other side uh, of the process. The last time I saw him, he was talking about nanobots. <laughs> you have no nanobots. <laughs> no it's nanobots today. <laughs> uh, he's got no nanobots today. But, uh, so while he's setting up, yeah, there's very small uh, robots now that we can do drug delivery systems. Swallow it as a capsule. We can then direct it to a part of your body to actually start dealing with things. So it's, it's actually in the scene. He actually, I think next time I'll ask him to bring one with him. <laughs> Bavesh, over to you. Thank you very much. Could I ask you to put the lights down if uh, at all possible? Thanks. So, so as Barry says, uh, I, I'm from Wits University, um, uh, very different from what you've heard uh, so far. I'm a microbiologist. Uh, I work in the lab. I work with the TB bacteria. Um, and today, really what I want to illustrate is, uh, you know, um, we, we use this term TB, we speak about this disease, but I don't know if it really sinks in how bad the problem is. Today as we stand, TB has killed more people than HIV and malaria combined. Yet it's one of the oldest diseases known to humanity, right? Um, and yet we still, t we still struggle with it in the modern era of healthcare delivery. Simply illustrates that there hasn't been sufficient attention. There isn't enough uh, uh, priority given to solving TB. Um, and where my personal interest lies is in trying to create innovation, you know, useful innovations that we can scale in a country like ours to deal with the TB problem. And so I'm going to give you an example of that today. You've heard a lot um, earlier in the morning about problems in the healthcare system, problems with drug delivery, problems with getting vaccines. I'm going to try to give you some sense of hope of what we're trying to do here in the country to deal with the problem, but trying to tailor the solutions to something that's particularly South African and a need that's in South Africa. So, so you know, we, we have this, um, the state of the lung. That's the, the title we've been given. So I thought I'll start with that, the lung. Um, you know, and so what TB is, it's a, it's a bacterial disease. You know, we gets transmitted by the sharing of air. And as the bacteria come into an infected lung, you... <laughs> okay, it's, it's fine, don't worry, we'll, we'll get through it. Um, you, you know, you, you get the, the formation and, and you know, really, um, uh, Stacey did a really wonderful job of these holes. Um, you know, these, you get the formation of these holes in, in your lung. Um, and, and eventually, um, these holes lead to what we call complete respiratory insufficiency. You can't breathe because the lung tissue has been destroyed. You know, and that effectively, when you put that into the context of a person who's sick, and we think about how TB is being transmitted, it's those bacteria that then, you know, are sitting in the lungs that then get coughed out, and when we share air, um, you know, we all breathe the same air, guys. This is not one person's problem. This is the whole country's problem. Right? And when we share air, we actually then transmit disease. Right? So today I have a simple message for you, is that you know, in addition to all the problems that you've heard of, um, that there's a lot of complexity in these bacterial populations, in these TB bacterial populations that we're trying to eliminate in the lungs of infected TB patients. Right? And I really want to kind of couch this in this evolving idea of the TB care continuum. So today you've heard about TB, the disease, and a really wonderful rendition of what you know, what it means to have TB disease, right? But what you see when we think about TB disease, that's really the end point of an entire sort of um, continuum of events, you know? It starts off with people getting infected, trying to engage with the healthcare system, getting diagnosed, and then getting put onto treatment. And then hopefully that treatment is curative. That is not always the case. And, you know, you, the outcomes that, that come from engaging within the healthcare system. And I'm glad that, that Stacey went before me. <laughs> because, you know, one of the big things we want to do is find the missing cases. You were not diagnosed. You were missed. 
Um, and that has actually become a priority from the World Health Organization, and then it's become a national priority. We need to find all these missing cases. And for a couple of reasons, you have all these people who are coughing in the community. I mean, then we also have people who, um, and Stacey mentioned these too, the people who are what we call latent or sleeping, or you know, people who don't have active disease, but their ability to transmit disease is not known. So we have these people in the community, and if we don't find them, we can't stop transmission. If we don't stop transmission, we will never kill this epidemic, right? So we need to find people, right? We need better diagnostics, and how do we, how do we work to getting diagnostics at work in the South African setting, right? And when we think about diagnostics, and I'm, there's a lot to talk about, but I'm just going to tell you, again, the bacterial perspective, right? Let's, let's highlight three problems. The first is we have, a, we have a significant problem with diagnostic pickup. We miss a lot of cases who are in the community, but also cases who come to the clinic, we miss them because we don't have um, diagnostics that are sensitive enough, right? And this is people who are living with HIV, and I'll, and I'll tell you why in a minute, right? Um, children, you know, we heard, cho we heard a lot about children this morning, right? You know, around sexual abuse, around children's rights, around universal access to health care, but children have been notoriously neglected when it comes to TB. Um, and also pregnant women. In South Africa, we want to implement universal testing for TB in pregnant women because a lot of pregnant women have undiagnosed TB then trying to understand how people are responding to therapy. We actually don't have good ways of measuring this. Um, and then finally, you know, getting better diagnostics to pick up the missing cases, right? And in all of these, the bacteria become incredibly important, right? So this idea, and again, Stacy mentioned it, the bacteria are sleeping. I like to say dormant, sleeping. Or you've also heard this term persisters, bacterial persisters. Um, and so what are, what are bacterial persisters? Is it, has everybody heard this term, persisters? Have you been told before when you're on antibiotics, finish the antibiotic course? Yeah? Yeah? I'm going to show you why, right? So persisters, you know, they're a form of variation we find in bacteria, right? And so to illustrate why, I'm going to use, um, I'm going to use Beth, <laughs> right? So we all know Beth. So now imagine that we, instead of one Beth, we had four of them, right? All genetically identical, all coming from the same lovely mother, <laughs> and all able to do four times as much work, right? Um, so, but, so these are all four identically, genetically identical births, right? But each one of these have a different lived experience, right? So the first one, you know, has lots of friends, as a kid made lots of constructive relationships, goes to yoga, lives a balanced life. Um, the second one was bullied as a child, is bullied at work, is forced to do things she doesn't like. The third one was very studious, always studying, did very well in school, was an overachiever. And the fourth one, you can't see at the bottom, there was a stress ball. Everything was a crisis, right? So now, if you imagine that all of these different experiences will then imprint differently on the bits, and while they are all genetically identical, they've all had different lived experiences, right? If we then impose a stress on the bits to say, organize a state of disease workshop and deal with all these unwieldy people, I think it's safe to say that the different bits are all going to respond slightly differently <laughs> depending, on, depending on their lived experience. So lucky for us, we have the one on top, right? <laughs> so so if, you, <laughs> if, you, if you think about that, think about that, and let's apply it to bacteria, right, guys? So I'm going to show you a little movie, right? This is a TB bacteria. You see that, guys? When the bug is green, it's just a marker for, for living versus dead. When the bug is green, it's alive. When it's not green, it's dead. And so this is a movie, it's run by our collaborators in Switzerland, where we grow the TB bacteria and then we apply antibiotics, the ones that TB patients would take. And watch what happens, right? So here's the bug growing with no antibiotics. Do you see the bug growing? Yeah? Right, then we apply isoniazid. Isoniazid is an antibiotic we give to TB patients, right? Immediately what happens? The bacteria stop growing, right? And do you see the ones all popping, right? See them dying? Right, so you see one first wave of killing, right? And then, slowly but surely, you see some don't die. Do you see that? Even though the antibiotic is there. And then this one is dying slowly. Right, so you think, oh, you take antibiotics, all the bacteria die. It doesn't work that way, right? You have some that die quickly, and then you have some that die slowly. Now, if you look here, these bacteria are growing Look at that, in the presence of the antibiotic. We haven't taken it away yet, right? So you'd think that these are drug-resistant bacteria. But watch, slowly but surely they start dying too. Did you see that? That one popped, yeah? So this is what happens inside the lungs of TB patients 
wave after wave each time they take antibiotics, right? I mean, you get this fast killing, and so these are the persisters. Now we remove the antibiotic, and look what happens. Right? And you add the antibiotic back again, and the whole thing starts again, right? So I, just, I use this movie to illustrate the complexity. You know, you take a pill, um, and this is what we're trying to achieve with, with that pill. You know, you're repeatedly you've got to take these tablets for six months. It's incredibly difficult to eradicate these bacteria. But how can we use this? How can we use this to actually develop better diagnostics, right? And so in the last bit of my, my comments to you, I just want to focus on one of these frames, right? So guys, remember here we had the bugs that died quickly and then the ones that didn't die, right? And let's talk about their ability to grow in the lab, right? So in the lab, we grow bacteria either on solid media in these plates, or we grow them in liquid media. We usually diagnose TB by growing it in liquid media, right? Everybody with me so far? Okay? So if you look at the bugs that died, right, the ones that respond to therapy, they actually grow pretty fine. They grow on solid media, they form these little colonies, and they grow cool in liquid media too. You can get them to grow up, right? But the ones that don't die, these ones here, right, when you put them onto solid media, you find that they don't grow, right? They're very hard to grow, sleeping, difficult to wake up, lazy bacteria. And when you put them in liquid media, they don't want to grow also, lazy, right? So they need some growth stimulant. And so I mean, when I think of growth stimulant, I think of Red Bull, right? So what does Red Bull do? Red Bull gives you wings, yeah, right? So we're building a team of microbiologists. So if you, <laughs> if you add a little bit of Red Bull, so this is a stimulant we make in the lab, you can actually get these sleeping bacteria to wake up, right? And this becomes important um, when you want to diagnose TB in cases where you have very few bacteria. And so we decided to see, can we wake these sleeping bacteria to make TB diagnostics better? Right? And it becomes incredibly important when we think of the local context. So two very simple questions. Can we find these sleeping bacteria in sputum from patients here in South Africa? And what are the implications for diagnosing TB? And for the Red Bull, we use this thing called culture filtrate. That's just we grow up bacteria in the lab. And when bugs are growing, they make this juice to help each other grow. And so we take that and we use it to stimulate, uh, to stimulate bacteria. Um, and so... Coming back to the state of the lung, right? Let's talk a little bit about the state of the South African lung. So normally, if you have an immune compromised, uh, an immune competent individual, and you look at their lungs, you know they've got these holes, as Stacy said. You know they, they they generate a lot of bacteria, and when you look in the sputum, you can find high bacterial numbers. But South Africa is home to a lot of people living with HIV, yeah. Um, and in fact, when you look at these numbers. South Africa is home to the world's worst HIV TB epidemic. That's just the dark blue at the bottom there. You see that, guys? We are home to the world's worst TB HIV epidemic. Now, what is the impact of HIV on TB disease? What, do you, what does HIV do, guys? Suppresses your immunity, and it takes away your CD4 T cells, right? You hear the CD4 T cell count, right? Without the CD4 T cells, you can't make these big holes, and so you don't have lots of bacteria in the lung. And when you take the sputum from individuals who are living with HIV and they have TB, you find that there are very few numbers of bacteria, and these people are often misdiagnosed. They're very difficult to diagnose. So we did a very simple thing. We went to the lab. This is a standard lab culture that we grow for TB, and to that we added some Red Bull, right? And then we applied the... The normal processing, you know, we added an antibiotic to prevent contamination, and we added the sputum sample. Um, and so we basically gave this culture wings, right, <laughs> by giving it a bit of the Red Bull. And we took this modified assay, and we went and tried to diagnose HIV-infected people who are negative on sputum smears and have a very low gene expert cycle threshold. And this is just a, a very brief vignette of the data. So here's just a normal way of diagnosing. And the red dots are the way we've devised. And so the scale here is a time to culture positivity. How quickly can we diagnose? And you see that when we add the red bull, you can actually diagnose people quicker. Right? So a very simple intervention that allows you to diagnose TB. So yeah, can we find these sleeping bacteria? Most definitely. Um, and we can stimulate them to wake up. Right? And if you think that you know, something as simple as this, we can use it to you know, find missing cases, you know, pick up... Uh, uh, whether, uh, develop new ways of, of monitoring how people respond to therapy and also you know, modifying the existing TB diagnostics. And so that's just to give you a sense of where we are. That's, these are some acknowledgements of the funders. 
But just as a brief parting vignette, um, Barry. Three minutes. Okay, cool. I have three minutes. So, so you know, I've just um, I've come from the WHO. Um, I was uh, I was asked to speak um, on during their World TB Day events. I um, mean, I was in India before going to Geneva, and so the WHO flew me from from New Delhi through Turkey to Geneva. It's a horrible trip. Um, but you know, I was in this Turkish airport. It was at midnight, and you know, as as people do, we find ways of amusing ourselves in the airport. Um, and so I, this guy called me to this kiosk, and he says, I have to show you this. You know, and he takes my cell phone, and he plugs it into a little device that projects a 3D hologram of photographs on my cell phone. Right? And I was completely shocked. So to make sure he wasn't duping me, he takes a photograph of my shocked face, and he, he gets a 3D hologram of that. You know, and, and what never ceases to surprise me, that it's in this world, um, in this world where we've had this level of technological advance, we still crush tablets and give them to children. We still give patients who have drug-resistant TB painful injections. Um, and it's because we haven't prioritized applying innovations to TB. And so I think we need to look inwards. We as a country need to develop the innovations for our setting. And I hope I've, I've illustrated to you how we can do that. Thank you. Well, that certainly woke us up. So we went from the human face and now we went to the test tube huh? and, and the kind of stuff that we're doing. Pavesh and myself serve on the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Thanks, Karina. If you can just set up. Are you speaking or you have a slide? Uh, two slides. Yeah, okay. You can set up in the meantime. Karina is from the Legal Resources Center. Also worked with her on the class action lawsuit. So we're going to talk about that just now. A five billion run fund that's actually meant that if you do bad things to people, we will catch you out. And uh, so that's going to be what she's talking about. So Bavesh and myself serve on the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. BRICS, 56% of the world's TB burden is in the BRICS countries. And for the last 40 years, except for the most recent two drugs, yeah, the, the, we've had just two new, for 40 years, we've had no new drugs in TB. No new pediatric preparations. There are parents that have to crush tablets. Imagine giving a, a one-year-old child crushing tablets, and well, you went through the other process, whereas an adult, you were taking them for six months. Uh, for multidrug resistant TB, 18 months you know, of, of treatment. So, and I think you've got the pill counts. It's something like two million tablets or something to be taken for the clinicians that are in the room. Every day, you know, for 18 months or this, and then we've got extreme drug resistant TB, and then a concept called total drug resistance. So we're grateful for the work that Bavesh is doing, but the key area is on new diagnostics, new drugs, and possibly a vaccine. And, and, and Bavesh is leading our South African team in terms of the representation. So I lead the overall team, uh, but Bavesh leads the research team in terms of uh, working with our counterparts in BRICS in terms of pulling this off. Karina, over to you on a very interesting uh, process with the gold mining companies, and uh, we were grateful that uh, three legal teams came together. Uh, Abraham Kivitz and uh, uh, Richard, uh, Richard Spoor, who has also been involved with listeriosis. Yeah, watch what you're eating in terms of Polonia. <laughs> so anyway, he moved on to listeriosis. You know the Polonia saga? But uh, Richard Spoor and Legal Resource Center, which came in as a very important grouping that dealt with the dependence. But in terms of, so uh, Charles, dealt, uh, Charles Abrams dealt with TB. In mine workers, Richard Spoor dealt with silicosis. And, uh, and later on when I talk, I'll talk a bit more about the work that I do. Over to you, Karina. Thanks so much. Um, do I, does, can everybody hear me? Oh, so very good, very good, that's fine. Um, I, I'm, I profoundly apologize that I must follow Stacey and Babesh because this is deeply dull legal stuff. There's, there's no poetry and no emojis. Um, <laughs> there are very, very few jokes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, and, 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 you know, to be fair, to lawyers, this is fascinating and, and it is very serious. So I'll, but I'll, you know, try and keep you awake. Um, so I know there are clinicians. So it's also one of the things is it's incredibly hard to try and distill seven years of litigation into 15 minutes. It's an incredibly complex case with complex outcome many people involved. So I've only sort of highlighted the really important things. And some of the things, I'm not trying to give you a diagnosis, but why I highlight some of the things is because they are the things that legally are really important. And one of the, the first thing is that silicosis is irreversible, it's incurable, it's painful, but very importantly, it is utterly and completely preventable. 
So the idea that there was a gross miscarriage of justice in causing people to have silicosis is very important to understand from the outset. The second thing is you can only get silicosis from mining. You cannot get it anywhere else. In legal terms, again, this is really important because when you're claiming damages from someone, you have to show that they caused the damage to you. So this is really easy. It's a slam dunk. You can't get it anywhere else. The mines were complicit. TB is a little bit more complicated. And one of the reasons I'll explain at the end why the settlement we achieved is such an achievement is because we got TB included. And the mines were fighting that tooth and nail. So silicosis can take 10 to 15 years after exposure to a peer. Um, so it also is a very long um, time for diagnosis. Many people go undiagnosed. There are not a lot of people who can diagnose silicosis understand it. It's, it's very hard to detect in the lungs. Um, it, it can create very severe complications for people. One of the reasons the, the, the LRC decided to also really focus on dependence is the impact that it can have on the dependent families. Some people have silicosis and they have radiological silicosis for a long time and it doesn't get any worse. But there are also a lot of people for who it progresses to very bad stages where they need oxygen machine, machines, they have heart failure, they, have, they, they get really incredible back problems. Um, and so they have to be taken care of by their family. And so it's normally the daughters and the mothers that have to give up everything to stay at home and look after them. So for us, the dependence of silicotic miners were also very important. There's a dispute really about how many people we're talking about. We're talking about the whole Southern African region. So it's Botswana, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and South Africa, Lesotho very much. So you know, I think Dr. Barry can probably give you some other numbers. We're thinking somewhere around 196,000, but the upper estimate of that is 500,000, but I suppose the settlement will tell us. So the thing about it is that's important as well is that the mining industry has known about silicosis for more than 100 years. Um, they've been warned over and over again. Before the turn of the 19th century, uh, so the, the 20th century, they knew about this. And it's very interesting when you go to the townships and you consult with clients, nobody calls it silicosis. You have to tell them you're talking about titus. Um, they still refer to it either as fetus or titus. They, they don't talk about silicosis. I had a whole consultation in the Eastern Cape, and then they asked me, what are you talking about? And I was like, All right, okay, we have to talk about that. Um, but in any event, I'm just listing the commissions there for you. The mining industry has known about this for a very long time. And in fact, there was legislation to manage this um, throughout the century. And then, of course, what, what Barry is also important in implementing, and we, I talk a lot in alphabet soup, so we talk about a DEMWA, it's the Occupational Diseases and Mines and Works Act, and I say LRC for Legal Resources Center, it's a lot of that. So if, if just put up your hand if I'm saying something that's not clear to everyone. Um, and so the mines were aware of, of the diseases, and there was actually statutory compensation for it, paid for by the mines, and despite that, up until 2008, there really was not an actual real attempt by the mines to control dust levels. Um, and in fact, in, the dep in 2008, the Department of Minerals noted that there is a pervasive culture of non-compliance to legislative requirements. As part of the court case, we we're assured by the mines that since 2008, things have dramatically changed. And part of the settlement I'll talk about in a bit is that they're saying they think it's unlikely there'll be any future diagnoses of silicosis. We'll have to see. So it takes a long time to diagnose. We won't know for a while. Um, so there's, there was litigation before. So one thing, Barry, is that the LRC is also involved in silicosis. It's not just the dependents. And we actually, in 2004, started the first test case, which was called Blom or the President Stain litigation. And that was meant to be a test case. One of the big problems with the mining companies, of course, is that you have to get the information out of them. The silicotic miners don't have the information. They have it. The mines have it. So we started this very lengthy process, and it's, it's called discovery. And in, in it's a process in terms of which you subpoena the companies to get all of their records. All of the practice surrounding dust levels, all of the practices surrounding medical care, control in the shafts, and that sort of thing. And the case was only against Anglo-America, and the reason for that is between 1965 and 1999, Anglo-America, despite not necessarily being the owner, controlled or operated or managed most of the gold mines in the country. So this was a test case to get from Anglo 
all of their operational material, all of the diagnoses on silicosis, all of the information that they had. It is mountains of information. We have one whole office stacked with boxes only on silicosis. It is, an, it was, and this litigation uh, only ended in 2013. And all of this information was essential to move on to the class action. And the idea was that once you have the information from the first case, you could then start an industry-wide class action. At the same time, I'm not sure how many people are aware, but one of the really problematic aspects of Odimwa is that it excludes mine workers from compensation in terms of um, COIDA, for which I also can't always remember the full name, compensation for occupational injuries and disease. So if you have an injury on, on the job, I'm sure you're aware, then you can claim from Barry, and he's going to give you money, and you can get a pension, and the, the payout is quite big. But if you're a mine worker getting silicosis, then you get a really tiny sum of money. At the moment, for silicosis first degree, it's only 63,000. And <clears throat> very few people use the provisions of a demo for follow-up medical care. But if you claim in terms of COIDA, your benefits are much better. But in terms of COIDA, if you claim, you can't claim in civil damages. So you can't claim from your employer for causing you any ex additional medical damage or pain and suffering. Odemo doesn't say the same thing, but the mines had been saying that they won't pay any damages because COIDA has this thing. They were claiming you can't, the miners can't claim damages. So uh, Richard Spoo and Charles Abrams first had to do this case of Mr. Mankai, um, to, in which the Constitutional Court then said, Odemo does not have the same provision, and we can go ahead and claim civil damages for all of the mine workers who have silicosis. The irony of Mankai is that Mr. Mankai died a few days before the judgment, and so he's probably going to get, we'll get to it, a dependent benefit, but he's never going to get the full payout that he's really entitled to. Um, so there was quite a race to get to the first class action. Class actions are new in South Africa. They're very novel. This is the first class action settlement. Um, and so nobody really knows exactly how we're going to do it, to be completely honest. Um, but don't tell people. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> there were five separate applications. Now, this creates a problem. You really want to get benefits for everyone, not just, you know, the separate pockets with, with d three different sets of lawyers. The LRC represented all of the whole uh, Anglo-American class. So our class was only going to be against Anglo. But, of course, there are loads of other mining companies. And Charles sued some of them and Richard sued some of them. So in 2013, some young minds got together. Don't let any of the SCs tell you it was them. It wasn't. It was some young lawyers who got together. And they devised a plan to join all the class actions and to have one big industry-wide class action against all of the gold mines in South Africa. Historic, current, try to get all the orphan mines. It's very difficult. All of the different shafts got sold and traded and all of those things. So... There was one big class. Now, you can imagine when you start litigating against African rainbow minerals, Anglo, Harmony, Goldfields, what that means in terms of litigation. It's a mountain of paperwork. They were going to always fight tooth and nail, especially the dependents and TB. So, um, so there were two classes, really, that we were claiming for. One was for underground mine workers and gold mines. So this only applies to gold mines. There's a separate coal mining case that's hovering in the background. Um, there's, so all on the underground mine workers at gold mines and anyone who worked in a gold mine from 1 March 1965 to up to date now um, who worked underground. TB is the same except that you have to show at least that you worked at a mine in the last two years since your diagnosis. So that was for causality. So you can't, it's not... Um, the same as silicosis where if you just worked at a gold mine at any time, you have to show that you were diagnosed within two years of leaving the mine. Um, something that's very important for this case was if you as a person die in, say, a motor vehicle accident, your family can claim your actual damages, the money that you lost. Um, and, sorry, I just want to check time. Oh, no, no, Barry, no. Um, very good. Um, but if you were, so if you were alive and you had some pain and suffering, that's not a specific medical expense. You institute your claim and you're claiming 15,000 Rand for pain and suffering. If you die, your family can only get the money for the actual damages that you had, the, the medical expenses. They can't get the pain and suffering. And we felt that that was incredibly unfair for such a gross violation of human rights. 
and we wanted the dependents to get the full benefit that they could, the full amount of money. And this was a massive change in our law. In our common law, you cannot get that because it's a personal thing. Your pain and suffering can't be transferred to another person. So if you die, your pain and suffering is gone and you can't, the, your estate can't get the money for that. We won that point, um, and the mines were appealing it, but basically we won the point that the dependents, the daughters and the mothers and the aunties and everybody who was looking after the silicotic miners should get the full amount of money that they're owed. The second thing was parent company liability. Anglo-America claimed that it never owned any mines, so they were not responsible, and a very important international principle. Yes, very, that's very good. Uh, I was at their offices today. Um, we've all become great friends. Um, uh, I still refer to them, but now in their presence as the forces of darkness. Um, so, Anglos, but, but what we have to show in international law, and there are loads of precedents for it, but it's the first time in South Africa, is that they controlled the mines. And if everybody followed their standard, then they have parent company liability. Whether they were the actual owner isn't important. It's whether they owned, operated, and managed the mines that's important. So the classes were certified. I'm just going to briefly do the settlement, Barry. Um, and so after the certification, the mines, the mines and us all really got together for the first time to really talk about settlement. There'd been few settlement talks, but it was serious now because now we were going on appeal to the SCA. Then we would end in the Constitutional Court. And the way that this would, was set up is that if eventually we were going to start doing individual claims for mine workers, it would take us about 10 years. People are dying at an incredibly fast rate. The LRC started with 13 class representatives. We now have eight. It's really tough to see your clients dying. Um, you know, I, can, I watch my clients go from coming to consult with me in their own car to coming to consult with me with their son with a walking frame because they get ill to that extent in six months. It's so getting a settlement became a, a, you know, a case of, of real urgency. But you can imagine negotiating with six gold mining companies, each with its own interest, each with outside interest internationally, uh, listed on the stock markets, it's incredibly hard to get these people to agree to something. What we've achieved here in terms of people sitting around a table and talking is really quite incredible. Um, and then there were three sets of attorneys, the LRC, Spur, and Abrams Kivitz. So, and we spent days and days and days locked in a room at Bowman's trying to hash this out. And what we've agreed on is really excellent. So for silicotic mine workers, we didn't just agree on underground mine workers. We agreed on old gold mine workers that actually did risk work. So even if you didn't do underground work, if you worked in one of the laundries or you worked somewhere where you were in close contact with, with uh, silica dust and you contracted silicosis, then you also get a benefit. So it's not just underground mine workers. And we think that is an incredible uh, broadening thing. Um, and the mining companies actually offered that, and that's because they want to, it's sort of how they view it as an acknowledgement. Um, although they'll never legally admit liability, the settlement is without liability, just so you know. But they do want to settle once and for all all the silicosis claims, so they're trying to include as many people as possible. Second really good achievement is that we included radiological silicosis for which you can't get a benefit in terms of law at the moment. You can only get it if you have silicosis first degree or second degree in terms of the laws. So for anyone who's just diagnosed with silicosis but they don't really have a severe impairment yet, there's also a payment of 70,000 Rand. Then if you have first degree silicosis, 70, 000, uh, 150,000. Second degree, 250,000. And then there's a special category for the people who got really ill, the ones who have heart failure, um, lung cancer, any of those things. Depending on an assessment, they can get between 250 and 500,000. Dependents, a little bit more complicated. Uh, the mining companies, up until the very last, wouldn't settle on dependents. So we see it as a very big achievement, even though it's not a very high amount of money. But we would have, if we had to go to trial, just to explain, we would have been, we would have spent days and days trying to assess loss of a breadwinner and loss of income, having to lead evidence about it. A lot of the widows don't have any paperwork or evidence. And so it, it really was a, a, qu a question of compromise on those things. If you can show cause of death as silicosis, then you get 100,000 rand. If the person died after 2008 and they have a certificate from Barry, then they can get 70,000 rand. Um, so it's a question of also lightening the burden of proof. Most people have their demo certificates. TB, there's two categories. It's current and historical. If you have TB um, from 1994 to now, 
and you were diagnosed within one year of your last shift, then first degree is 50,000, second degree is 100,000. Historical tuberculosis, which is before 1994, if you were issued with a certificate um, and you were diagnosed within one year of your last shift, if your certificate doesn't say anything, then it's 10,000 rand. And if it says first or second degree, then it's the same amounts, 50 and 100,000. Um, and then dependents also get a benefit of 100,000 rand for cause of death. And it's an important distinction. With silicosis, very rarely you'll find it there certificates that say silicosis. But you very frequently find ones with TB. So it's important that they get that 100,000 rand as well. Trust is going to run for 12 years with a one-year um, turnout phase. Nobody cares about the trustees because Barry is one of them. Um, very important for people spreading the news about this. There's no lump sum payment. This trust is not a money-making opportunity. It's incredibly important that people understand we specifically negotiate it this way. Trustees, people are not going to make money out of this. It's going to be an annual top-up based on an actuarial assessment of how many claims there are going to be per year. We've got bank and insurance guarantees from the mining companies in case one of them goes belly up because the gold mining industry is slightly insecure for 5 billion rand but that money is going to be paid in annual installments, also the administration fee. There are no lawyers, agents, or middlemen in the trust because this is the kind of trust where the, the claimant has to come to the trust to be diagnosed. You, there's no need for anyone to pay a lawyer or pay a union or pay an agent 10% or 15% of, of their payout. We're really trying to prevent someone from taking the mine workers' money. So the mine workers have to the, come to the trust. The other thing that's very important, but I'll, I put it on the victories and the, and the limitations, is screening and testing. The way that we've set up the trust, we can't really tell the trustees how to do it. They're going to have to do it themselves. But the way that we envisioned it when we set it up is that it was going to be not a centralized process, but a rollout of services the way that Aurum does it with their TB rollout. That these moving vans with screenings and ATMs and everything goes out and find people in the rural areas so that people don't have to come to Joburg to do it. This is important because we have to go to other countries as well. So it really, we're trying to reach as many people as possible. Um, another thing, so I'm just quickly, I've talked about some of the things we thought we really want. Um, so one of the things that's really great about the trust is the synergy with the MBOD and with Barry's department and the department of... Um, Health, is it? Yeah, we've created an overlap between this trust and what Barry does. If you have a DIMWA certificate, it will be accepted as proof with the trust. And if you have a certificate from the trust, Odimwa, then the MBOD will accept it. And the way that we're setting up the databases is that if you come into the trust, it'll trigger if you're owed money by the state so that you don't just get the 150,000. If you also owed the 63,000 by state, you'll get the 63,000 plus the 150. And if you owed money by the provident funds, because there's millions sitting in the provident funds for X miners, it'll trigger that as well. And so we're trying to really clear all the backlogs in the mining industry to try and get people the money that they owed. So this trust has been set up to resolve quite a lot of problems and to really work together with government as much as we can to get the benefits to people. One thing that's last thing, Barry, that's going to be a difficulty to explain to people is there are only six settling companies. There are companies that haven't settled. So if you worked at a mine that is not a settling mine, or if you worked at an orphan mine or a mine that is one of for Glencore, one of those, those mines are not covered by the settlement because they simply don't exist anymore. So that's going to be a problem to explain to mine workers when they come into the trust and the trustees say to them, sorry, you get zero money, or sorry, we've looked at your 150, but for 10 years you worked at Bracken Mine, you're not covered by the settlement, we're taking all 50,000 of your money. That's going to be something that we'll have to explain quite well. But all in all, I think yeah. it's probably good. So the last thing is the hearing to, the pr settlement has to be approved by the High Court. That's going to be on the 29th to the tw 31st of May. So we're but we're very optimistic it'll go well. So, yeah, so we're hopeful that the trust can start rolling out by the end of the year. Thanks. I'm really sorry, this, th this is a landmark judgment. Yeah. Anastasia, if you can come forward, uh, yeah, the, with Nomfundu and uh, Zondikazi, yeah, while we're setting up. This 
is the single biggest class action in the mining sector in the world. So oil and gas is slightly different. There have been big environmental and other, other claims on the environmental issues facing oil and gas sectors. Uh, Union Carbide in India never had such a settlement, which was a gas leak, if you remember Bhopal. But this is the single biggest sector, and, and thanks to the colleagues that worked on the ground, like Karina, that worked for Eastern Cape mine workers. A third of them come from the Eastern Cape. A third come from Mozambique and Lesotho. It's, and it's all within an entire socioeconomic uh, you know, consideration of migrancy, poverty, and a range of stuff. Anastasia and your team, let's hand over to you, and, uh, and then we'll just say, I'm unfortunately going to eat into your tea break because you ate into my lunch break. <laughs> so I, just allow me that uh, extra 15, 20 minutes afterwards. Anastasia. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Anastasia. I'm going to be talking to you about the Erosa project. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say thanks to Beth for inviting us. She was incredibly accommoda accommodating of us, so thank you very much. And thanks to all the previous speakers. It was really interesting talks. Um, so the way this is going to work is I'm going to present some segments and then Zondikazi and Numfundo are going to present others and I'll introduce them. Um, so before I start talking about the projects, I just want to acknowledge uh, our funders and our support and our institutional support. So we get a lot of institutional support from UCT, the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine, the Welcome Center for Infectious Disease Research in Africa, so a lot of word soup as well, um, and then the research group I'm based in, the Molecular Microbacteriology Research Unit, and how this all fits together will get clear, clear, clearer later. Um, and then, of course, our funders, the South African National Research Foundation and the Wellcome Trust. And then, in addition to funding and institutional support, there are a lot of people that help us with this project um, and give up their time for free, and I just want to acknowledge them all, um, well, at least some of them, on this slide. Um, okay, so what is EWOZA? It was as a collaboration between myself, Anastasia, that's me, in my DSL3 suit. I feel like I have to put this slide up because people don't believe that I do lab work anymore. But that is actually me, and that's my discipline. Um, in terms of what Chris was talking about yesterday, I'm trained as a molecular microbacteriologist. Um, and I, con I collaborate with a conceptual artist and soon-to-be PhD candidate, Ed Young, um, to do public, enge cu public engagements and community engagements. Um, so it was as recently developed into sort of four key arms, um, but what I'm going to tell you about first uh, is the core project that's been running since 2014. Um, so the way the project works is we recruit, we recruit learners from an organization called the Cumber Youth, and I don't know if people know about the organization, but they're an amazing organization that does extracurricular tutoring. Um, they've got branches all over South Africa, but their first branch was in Makaza Kailicha, and that's where we recruit learners from. They're amazing because they don't choose the most gifted learners from schools. Anyone can join extracurricular lessons um, so as long as they um, attend a certain amount of tutoring. And so we really like this model because it's just about wanting to better your academic marks, and we sort of adhere to that. So we start off with the recruitment and screening, um, and this acts as a celebration of the previ previous cohort's films. Um, as well as an advert to recruit new learners to the project. And we also don't recruit based on academics. It's about a willingness to participate and a, a want to tell stories. Um, we then move into a science workshop phase of the project. Um, and the science workshops are held at the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine. And I think what's important to mention here is we don't do health information because there's a lot of groups that do health information really well, and we didn't want to replicate that. So what we want to do is we want to engage young people with biomedical research. And so we do a series of workshops where learners get to do experiments in the lab. So some of the topics are TB basics. So what is TB from a biomedical perspective? What is biomedical research? So generating a hypothesis, how to interpret results. There's a lot of experimentation going on in the labs. And then the IDM also has a lot of internationally leading research groups in terms of TB research in the world. And so we ask these research groups to facilitate workshops. So we do TB drug discovery, TB vaccinology, which is facilitated by the, TB, the South African TB vaccine initiative, who child the first new TB vaccine in 100 years. And the vaccine, unfortunately, didn't work. It wasn't protective. But what it did show is that this kind of research can be done in South Africa by local people. So we love that workshop. Um, we also do a clinical trials workshop where we randomize learners to Coke or Diet Coke and then ask learners to perform a maths test and see which um, influences the maths test. And this really ir illustrates the principles of a clinical trial. And then once learners have been exposed to a bunch of biomedical research, we ask the learner groups to design their own research question. This question on the slide often comes up and it's often a very heated and debated uh, session. So we then move into a media production phase of the workshop, and I'm going to ask Zondi Kazi to talk about that. 
Zondikazi is one of our longest standing awards of participants turned facilitators. Um, so we're big on, at the moment, we've got a big focus on training and capacity development. She enrolled in AWARDS in 2016, and she per performed a really interesting, uh, she produced a really interesting film about TB and gender-based gender violence, which is on our website. I'd implore you to go look at it. Um, she's now a first year Bachelor of Education student at UWC, and she's an AWARDS facilitator and leader. Um, she's also finishing up production of, of a follow-up film um, to a 2017 film. So over to you, Zondi. Um, no, Cupid, we need you for the film. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, good day, all. And I'll be talking about the media workshops which are in from the studio. Um, this is the platform where we engage with different people from different communities. Um, the films are based on people's opinions about TB or anything else. So the structure of the workshops includes. Um, learning how to use the camera, where we take the camera home and interview people with, without the hours or coordinators around. Then we also go on shoot days with them around just for guidance. And then the last part of it is putting the pieces together. Um, putting the pieces together to make sense of what we're trying to portray to the, female, to the community. Sorry. Um, what my peers and I find the most difficult is when we're going to shoot in an area where we're not familiar with, but we all get excited when we're shooting in our own areas because it's more safer. Um, it is really amazing to be behind the scenes, as you can see. It is something that I truly enjoy, which is the reason why I'm still part of the project. So just so you know, these films are meant to educate people, but not to change their own point of views about something. And of course, we couldn't have done it all without Ed Young's guidance. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andy. Um, okay, thank you very much, Sondi. So the next part of the project, uh, I'm going to tell you something very briefly about. It's sexualities research that Nawazi already mentioned yesterday. Um, so this is the Well Sexuality Project. What Nawazi didn't tell you um, is that it was funded by a Welcome to Our Seed Award in the Social Sciences and, in, and Humanities. This was the first such award awarded to anyone in Africa last year. Um, the thrust of the award was to use the AWAS a model to do anthropological research around contemporary notions of sex and sexuality and how this might impact um, the uptake of public health programs. And so this was very new for AWASA because we were focused on TB, so we were moving into anthropology research and sexuality, and it, it was very much a pilot, um, and so we're still analyzing the data. The principal investigator was uh, Dr. Mkwanazi from WISA, who you've already heard from. We were the co-investigators, and the last thing I'm going to say about that, because there's no time, is please go and look at the website. There's some amazing media products on there. They're all freely available to use, um, and I can't tell you much more. Um, so the next part of EWOZA is the very creatively named Drug Resistance Musician MSF collaboration. We probably should have come up with a better name. Um, and that is led by Numfundo, so I'm just going to introduce her quickly. She's a PhD student at the Wellcome Center for Infectious Disease Research in Africa. She does some very deep and basic immunology looking for blood biomarkers of subclinical TB. She also leads this MSF Muso collaboration and she'll be leading the new schools program. So over to you. Um, hi everyone. So. Um, Basically, as you've already heard from Zondi, um, the learners from the core, it was a program, um, make films. And then for these films, they, they need music. So they use music to edit most of these films. And at the start of the program, they used to choose popular music from very famous musicians. And we, as, a, as we grew as a project, we actually realized that we couldn't afford uh, the rights to this music. So we, we asked learners to go around asking people around their communities who make music if they could use music from them in, the, in, the, um, in their videos. So what the musicians asked for was that could we as Ewoza then produce, make um, music videos from the music. However, at the time, we realized that it's not possible because we did not have the capacity to produce music videos. So when the chance came to write um, for, to apply for a new grant. Um, we chose to focus specifically on this, um, making music videos around TB. And we chose this because we've always wanted to work with the MSF because of the kind of work that they do in the communities. They do um, basic groundwork around TB. So that's the MSF drug resistant TB collaboration I was conceptualized. So this project is a collaboration between 
MSF, which is broadly known in South Africa as Doctors Without Borders, um, musicians in Kailicha. Um, so in these workshops, we um, are working with adolescents that were diagnosed with drug resistant, we're working with young adults who are diagnosed with drug resistant TB as adolescents and were then referred to a virtual support group with the MSF. Um, so in these workshops, we, the project is centered around workshops where the participants share and develop their journey with drug resistant TB from diagnosis to completing treatment and develop them into stories. Um, unlike the core EWOSA program, where the learners apply to take part um, in the pro program and have never had TB, participants in this project are either on or completed drug resistant TB treatment and don't have to apply to take part in the, pro in the project. This has posed a challenge um, with workshop attendance as they were, not, they were referred and it's not something they applied for, meaning that um, they didn't ask to take part in it, therefore um, attendance was a, a bit of a problem. So um, the other thing is, is that um, the process of treating drug resistant TB takes um, about two years and ha it has a lot of side effects. So it also caused problems around sharing the stories of um, the drug resistant participants. So with acknowledging these challenges, we then ad adjusted and adapted the workshops. Uh, so they're not similar to the ones for the core EWOSA program. And we adjusted them to suit the um, drug resistant um, TV participants. And so we made sure that the workshops for this project are different and they are more, they're smaller and a bit more intimate and they um, encourage story, story sharing. Um, yeah, so the workshops are held in and around Cape Town where we take, where we include activities that where we show the drug, drug resistant participants different ways that different people share their stories. And we're hoping that these activities encourage the drug our participants to actually give them ideas on how they can share their stories as well. Uh, the workshops currently do not include the musicians because the musicians can be quite intimidating. Um, and we also noticed that talking about the process and the journey of drug resistant TB is quite a cathartic process for some of the participants. So these stories are currently being refined and will be workshopped with the um, musicians in April. And we are hoping that um, in this workshops with the musicians, the stories will actually inspire the musicians to create, produce music and music videos using the participants' stories. And this, um, this music and music videos, we hope that we'll be able to share the participants' stories and help with actually removing the stigma around drug-resistant TB, as well as show that drug-resistant TB is not a death sentence. Thank you. Thanks, Mpana. Um, so I'm going to tell you about two more very quick things, the, um, and then I'm going to show you a film. Uh, the one thing is engaged scholarship. So we're trying to do scholarly research around public and community engagement. Um, and this is in the form of um, an anthropology PhD candidate. We call her our anthropologist. So she's an anthropologist based in a biomedical research institution and, in fact, in a molecular microbacteriology lab. Um, so it's inter interdisciplinary work. She's co-supervised and we're heavily reliant on Norwazi for conceptual input around her PhD, but her other supervisor is Prof Digby Warner, who is a molecular microbacteriologist. Um, we implemented an honors techniques course for infectious disease honors students. So these, again, are biomedical honors students, but we implemented a community engagement um, techniques course because we want to instill the importance of this kind of work in young scientists at very early stages of their career and also guidance on how to do this work. And we published a couple of research papers and we're hopefully going to publish some more this year. Um, and then finally, I want to tell you about something that's coming up before um, I show you the film. And this is a schools program. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using learner-produced media um, to stimulate discussion and activism around TB and other issues that are very closely associated with TB um, in local schools. So we'll, we often go shooting and looking for stories about TB, but stories about a lot of other social issues come up. And I think this really highlights, you'll see in the film, how TB can't be spoken about outside of those issues in a place like South Africa. Um, okay, so we can breathe a sigh of relief. I went through that very fast and we can watch a movie. It's quite long. So if we need to cut it for time, I completely understand. Um, it's sort of just taking a chance here. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll show you the beginning. Okay, so the film was made um, by Kola and Alpha. 
The film was made by Alpha about his dad, who's an ex-mine worker, and that's why I chose to, make, uh, to show this film in this session. Um, when Alpha told us he was making a film about his dad who's trying to get money from mining companies, we immediately thought of the TB silicosis case. And in fact, it's not about that. It's about a group of ex-mine workers who are trying to claim provident funds from mining houses, and it's part of a much bigger campaign we didn't actually know until the film was finished and being screened to the South African Destitute's Ex-Mine Workers Forum, that this is part of a much bigger campaign to get unclaimed benefits from big financial houses that are closing pension funds. And this is led by a lawyer called Rosemary Hunter, and there's been a bit of press about this. Um, it's quite a complex financial case. And before I play the movie, a quick plug, please follow us on social media and go and look at our website. There's a lot of really good films uh, besides for this one. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, let me show you the film. Thanks, thanks to uh, the team from Ewoza, and uh, really great that we, we, we're getting high school children involved, the students and pupils and learners at, even at that level, and then ultimately it's so great that you are now at UWC and beginning to actually follow through these processes. So thanks. I'm just going to give you some quick summary points. There are 1.6 million ex-mine workers in southern Africa. One third of them come from the Eastern Cape in terms of the migrant labor system. One third from Mozambique, Lesotho, and Swaziland. So when Karina talked about how do we ultimately provide the services, and yeah, you're getting the Western Cape also because there was a m movement. Remember, in terms of the previous dispensation, people couldn't move in different parts of the country. But since democracy, many people have moved from the Eastern Cape, so the migration in Eastern Cape to Western Cape, as opposed to Eastern Cape to Kauteng, which is slightly different in terms of the other migratory patterns. So that's why there's a large number of ex-mine workers that are also in the Eastern Cape. So we are working at how do we actually resolve many of these issues. We talked about a range of issues and some of the earliest work. Did we know there was a conference in 1930, the international, first international silicosis conference in Johannesburg at the Great Hall of Wits. Remember, Wits University was started off by the mining companies, the mining engineering school, and what was called the Pneumoconiosis Research Unit, the former SAIMR, South African Institute for Medical Research in Bramfontein with those pillars that you saw, was started by the mining companies because while they did the mining engineering school that ultimately became the forerunner of its university, they also set up a pneumoconiosis research unit because of this thing called Minostisis. So the act that I run is from 1912. It's 170th history, the Minostisis Act. So one of the issues is, did we know? 1930, Pale and Male, International Silicosis Conference. 1959, we had a second silicosis conference and yet we didn't intervene. And hence, we thank colleagues like uh, Karina. Of course, things have changed now. She quite rightly points us, we're all friends now. We sit in the same boardrooms. And if you look at all those big legal firms in, uh, in Santon, just go around. It was built on the backs of this class action. I'm joking, but... I know you're No, no, I'm, I'm pulling your leg. LRC is a slightly different ballgame. But each of the mining companies employed one of those big firms. Weber Wenzel, Bowman's was the, the same, but each of those big firms was then representing each of the multinational mining companies. So I'm going to throw it open for discussions. And the key area is that, what is the future? Mining was the bedrock. This country was a pastoral economy, the Cape of Good Hope. You needed hope in terms of the riches of the East from the colonizers of the West. Remember? They went around the Cape of Good Hope. They picked up, because of scurvy, they picked up water and fresh fruit and vegetables from Cape Town, or they repaired their ships there. But 1880, 18... 1867, uh, in a place called Hopetown. Anyone here from Northern Cape? A drunk person walking through a moonlit sky saw something shining. It was a diamond, Hopetown. And ultimately, that changed the face. Because 10 years later, so diamonds were discovered, and 10 years later, gold was discovered, 1886. That changed the face of South Africa to have the 11th largest stock exchange in the world. Santon? The Johannesburg Stock Exchange is number 11 in the world. In 1970, one rand equaled two dollars. Right, so it tells you where we were when ultimately gold was the currency reserve of the reserve banks of the world. You know, the Vietnam War and those of us who are old enough to remember these things. So, of course, things have changed since then. The key area is that the economic benefits didn't accrue to what you just saw in the last film and some of the people that we deal with, Karina, myself, and other colleagues that work on the ground in Shashai, Amzimkulu, etc. But going forward, we want to change the face of a pastoral economy, an agricultural economy, because this is mine workers. 
Farm workers get sprayed by pesticides. There's a whole range of issues about the long-term issues. Diesel motor mechanics with diesel particulate emissions. And then we face the issues around psychosocial issues in the workplace. But over to you, we've got about 15 minutes, um, and then we'll break around about this thing. So questions, comments, uh, things you want to bring together, and we love the interdisciplinary nature of the human face of TB, the audiovisual appearances of the people that we can, you know, we can only dream about and talk about, and then the issues about that face up, but now that there is some issues around bringing money, but money is not gonna be enough to bring back a loved one. Thanks, uh, Steve Reed from UCT. Um, I wanted to ask Stacy actually about uh, about her presentation of TB, and reflect on Barry's uh, comment that uh, we're in a war uh, with TB, and we often use the military uh, metaphor in the sort of so-called fight against disease and the burden of disease. And, sure. and Stacy talked about the relationship with her bacteria. Um, and I wonder if there isn't a more useful metaphor uh, in talking about TB, which has been around for centuries. Since the mummies. Uh, and why it's still around, and why we haven't won that war. And are we using the wrong uh, or an inappropriate um, way of thinking about it? And maybe we actually need to coexist in some way, but uh, in a more constructive way. I actually wasn't aware personally that there's such information. Reason being, myself, I once worked underground. Mm. That was at a mine called uh, King Ross Mines, which is about 180 kilometers east of Johannesburg, on the way to Thunderton. Uh, I worked there for about a year, uh, two years. And then there was a strike, and I remember our current president, Ms. Ramaphosa, during that time he was a union leader. NUM. NUM, that's right. He come, came there to plead with us to go underground. But we, this, at the end of the strike, but something said to me, there was a voice saying to me, quit, quit, quit. And I told the mine management that no, I'm no longer interested. Then they said, no. Uh, you are breaking your contract. Uh, you are supposed to work here. Then I insisted that no, I'm no longer going underground. And a way that I was uh, helping myself, two months after I left the mine, 177 people died there. Exactly. Underground. underground. And I was paid, my compensation was, I think, 94 rand. I still remember. 94 rand, I was paid it in a plate. Like that. And now, to cut the long story short, thanks so much. This is a huge information. I wasn't aware. So I think I do qualify. So I'm, I'm on board. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm on board. But again, there are quite a number of some people. By the way, I'm from Zimbabwe by birth. Okay, I've been here. I think I've got identity crisis, okay? because I don't know whether I'm a Zimbabwean or a South African. Uh, there are some other people. You mentioned the Southern Africa, really mentioned the, when? The Southland, what, what? In Zim, the... And Malawi and... Zim. And the Malawi and Zim. You didn't mention that. I don't know if they are covered there. They, they are covered. Oh, they are covered. <laughs> right. So there are quite a number of people. Some are long gone. Some I still remember. About three or five. Maybe chairperson. Not, if perhaps you, through your commission, you can send message, pass the message there through the Department of Mines to those countries to say, no, look, there's a class action here. All those ex-miners, please come forward. Maybe that can help. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. My name is Kesari Moodley. I'm a social entrepreneur. I've come up through the science and business background. I'm very encouraged to hear what is happening with the class action lawsuit. And I think there's room for maybe, I'm very partial to the education sector, that perhaps we, we could uh, buddy up and have a foundation for descendants of the mine workers for tertiary education. 
So I feel that it's very hopeful that now that this has been exposed, uh, for those of us that are consumers of products from the mines, you know, maybe this is a way we can give back to the descendants while you're doing the medical side. For the future of South Africa, maybe this is something that we can build on. So thank you very much for presenting your stories. I'm feeling very encouraged that, that there's a way as a fellow South African that maybe we can contribute to the mine workers. Thank you. Um, this is for Bavish. Um, just on the missing um, TB patients and um, finding the missing or, yeah, patients. I mean, the, the, the minister on Tuesday, yesterday, just announced that he was um, going to be plowing into like almost 500,000 into tackling um, TB issues. Um, one, one issue among which was finding the missing. I was just, just wanted you to talk to, you know, the issue of the missing patients. What are the factors there? You know, why do we have missing patients? Okay. We, we'll pull that. Stacy, can we start with you? Um, I, I, yeah, I'm to answer your question, and I, it's one of those things that I have struggled with and thought about a lot through my experience. And it becomes doubly problematic at a stage where we have drug-resistant tuberculosis, which is where the weapons we are using in this war are no longer doing anything. And, um, well, that's a simplification, I have sure people around me will say. But, but there's also a case where now, whereby increasingly people with TB who have been stigmatized in the past are now being criminalized. And I don't know if anyone has had a look at the kind of institutes that are being used to house people who are suffering from drug-resistant TB in some cases. So it makes the issue, it doubly complicates this idea of war, is the patient a criminal? Um, and so, and m based on my own experience and just the where we are at in the world, where we're suddenly having to rethink our relationship with the environment and that our bodies are not closed off, sealed entities. We have this idea of myself as a subjective person that wanders around, but we're breathing, we're sharing each other's air. Inside my gut, what is it, 8 billion bacteria that are living there? I can't remember the exact number in this moment. So all you guys are sitting there with 8, back, 8 billion bacteria in your stomachs. And this is another bacteria that's entering our body. Some bacteria are friendly, some are not. But we're not these isolated, sealed off, closed off people we led to believe. We're very porous and we need to start... I believe as a, as, a, as, a, as a humanity in a total has to start understanding what is our relationship with the world we inhabit, with the other beings and creatures, from the animals to the insects to the bacteria that we live in, and can we find more symbiotic ways to live in this world is, is for me the essential thing. Yeah. Well, we'll hope that Steve Reed was a professor of family medicine in Cape Town. Some of the academics will take this into the new, whole new process. As often we tell, tend to do, the, the, I did community medicine. Students never turned up at our classes, but go to open art surgery. You couldn't find room at the back, and including outside the theater. But public health, water sanitation, human side, music therapy. When I introduced a concept called uh, yoga therapy, uh, Ayurvedic medicine, Traditional healing practice of Sangomas, Icona. Uh, I'm going to deal with some of your issues on Zimbabwe and all through a presentation just now, but I want Bavesh, uh, because there was just some comments and yours on social entrepreneurship and mining. I don't think there's boycotts, because these are commodity issues that are much bigger than us, but that's a different issue. Bavesh, on missing cases, I mean, either of us can, but you, you go ahead. Yeah. No, so, so thanks for the question. It's a, it's a really important thing. I think, you know... Um, so the simple answer is we have a passive case finding model, right, versus active. We wait for sick people to come to us rather than going out and looking for sick people. And so that's the first problem, right? But to, to get to the heart of your question, who are missing cases? So these are individuals in whom diagnosis have failed. So these are people who've engaged with the healthcare system, but we haven't been able to diagnose them, either because they were triaged incorrectly at the clinic, they produced a specimen that didn't give us a result in the lab. And so that was the point at which we thought we'd start. Can we get these specimens that are really very poor in terms of bacteria, can we get them to flag positive, right? So individuals in whom diagnosis have failed, but they've engaged with the health system. 
Then there are individuals who have not engaged with the health system, so we haven't had a chance to diagnose them. They know they're sick, they're seeking health care in alternative settings. And then a third group of individuals who don't know that they're sick. So these are, and, th and they, they're in the community, and they're driving TB transmission rates. And you know, one can, you know, so, I mean, I, I was, uh, I, I listened with also keen interest to the commitment by the minister to find these missing cases. And you can imagine a continuum of activities, us trying to strengthen what's going on in the lab. So the specimens that come, we actually can get the best out of them. Then going and strengthening the health system where you having patients who are coming to the clinic, let's not miss anyone who has TB that comes to the clinic. Let's catch all of those people. And then the ones in the community, can we start thinking creatively about that? And I mean, anyone who knows me knows I love mobile technology. You know, so can we have a, a, an app on our phone that just monitors how many times you're coughing. It runs in the background like your sleep app or your fitness app and says, do you know you've been coughing 40 times in the last four hours and you have a high index of suspicion for TB? Your nearest point of care clinic is here and they've already been notified for, uh, that you're going to be coming. If you don't go in three days time, they'll give you a call. So you know, th there's a, there is a gap where we need innovation and there is a gap where we need to strengthen the health system and a gap where we need to strengthen the lab. And I think that we need activity across all of that. Yep. But what we're calling on is communication colleagues, anthropology, social sciences. Don't rely on us as biomedics to actually deal with the issues around missing cases and why. There's a whole lot of issues that factor in. The fact that colleagues from Kailicha or Langa can't get to Johannesburg, or Amzimkulu and Shashai, and how do we actually get out there in terms of the issue. Uh, so, but this, I'm just going to conclude with five minutes with just giving you some background issues. This is the Minestasis Act, which is on Dimwa. Uh, what Karina talked about, 1912. This act from 1912 to 1973 covered white workers only. There were big Durban strikes in 1973 that brought African workers into collective bargaining rights. That's when people, African workers, could organize into trade unions. So again, looking at the history of mining in South Africa, and then ultimately it came in. From 1973 to 1993, it was differentiated. If we paid out 10,000 rand for a white worker for silicosis, we paid 1,000 rand for a black worker. So it's a bit of history. This is the disease process, and that's what silicosis does. It eats up your lungs, uh, and then you have the process of it. This is the 1930 Pale and Male, uh, international experts that came to South Africa. And there's the Witz Great Hall, you can see. Hmm? <laughs> right, 1959 Pneumoconiosis Conference. This is what, ha what our history was. This is medical examinations of migrant African workers, which my colleague there from Zimbabwe would have gone under, under a thing called Vanilla, WNLA, Witwatersrand Native Labor Association, which recruited him. Right, Teba, the former NRC recruitment. And this is what, when we talked to colleagues, uh, ex-mine workers, they said it wasn't about the dignity, about being naked, losing the dignity. It was about the father and son in the same queue, uncle and nephew in the same queue. That was what they spoke about. And they cried when they actually remembered these kind of issues that faced us in the mining industry. So this is the 1 million ex-mine workers in South Africa, 300,000 in the Eastern Cape. This is the 1.6 million. This is the work that Karina, we've done about the, the master database. You can see that Lesotho, 200,000, Mozambique, 152,000. So this is the work we're doing. What is the disease burden? 200,000 claims. So you take the 108,000 for TB, this is the 30 years, 33,000 silicosis, etc. This is the people that built Santon. So that's the new issues, Kesri, that we've got to talk about. How do we take a new Santon forward with Shashai, Amzimkulu, etc and build a new framework in terms of the new dawn, as the president says. Australia, had 18 persons with coal workers pneumoconiosis, compared to our 300,000, yes, it was in two years. They had a Senate inquiry. This was the Bowen Basin, so it tells you the realities. This is the problems of TB in the mining sector, that if you have, mine workers have twice the risk of the general population, with HIV three times the risk, with silicosis six times the risk, and ultimately 18 times the risk, and that's why lots of mine workers died. So we've got a range of issues on tracking and tracing, on registration of mine workers, one-stop service centers decentralized uh, that we've put up in Lesotho, Mozambique, et cetera. So we've been working quite hard in terms of the process. Uh, these are mobile services that Karina talked about, where we go even with the banks. We take the banks to the ex-mine workers, and if they are eligible for a claim, we open a bank account there. Have you ever asked yourself how you fika somebody in Amzimkulu? Where's your utility bill? It's a prepaid electricity meter if you've got electricity. So we managed to come to the banks and take the banks to the people on the ground. This is Swaziland, we, and that's our mobile clinic, which uh, Karina talked about, which, which takes forward the process. This was Malawi, 30,000 ex-mine workers in Malawi. So uh, we've mapped the flow of money. 
And uh, basically, mine workers are very rich. If you find a mine worker, marry the mine worker. Or <laughs> okay. So they have 4 billion run in unclaimed pensions sitting in Johannesburg, 1.2 billion in my fund unclaimed, and 5 billion run in Karina's fund, of course, with this new settlement fund. So a mine worker in South Africa is worth 10 billion. But overall, there's 45 billion run in unclaimed pension and provident funds for 4.2 million workers in South Africa. The money is sitting in Santon. We've got to find the people and pay them their monies. 100 years ago, Saul Plyke, and he was a writer. Hmm? Very, very good colleagues. Secretary General of the ANC. He writes about the lives of mine workers in 1914. 200,000 heroes, by day and by night, laid down their lives to the familiar fall of rock and were deep levels ranging from 1,000 to 3,000 feet. In the bowels of their, sacrificed their lungs to the rock dust which developed minus thysis and pneumonia. So my act was 1912. ANC was found. There's no party politics. 1912. Two years later, the Secretary General writes about the lives and livelihoods of mine workers in Kimberley. All right, so thanks to Beth, and I hope this saying from the Health and Safety Executive says, and we're glad, colleague, that unfortunately your comrades died in Kinross. We've had also more recently Lily Mine, etc. So one of the issues that I do in occupational medicine, I've been the entire my life in, in, in the public sector. We are saying that workers must be fit for work, fit for life, and definitely fit for tomorrow. 